No, you're not fine? Okay, let us finish with a bank, right? <laughs> let us finish with this the monstrous derivation we are doing, and then I'll let you go to prepare for the exam, and I'll be around this afternoon to, to answer questions. So, what we were doing, ah, you are circulating the, this uh, attendance list, yeah, very good. So, what, are, what we were doing is the following. So, we want to do, so we're doing the exercise of the example, or the torture, whatever you want to call it, of the uh, empirical spectral density average over the The empirical spectral density average over the, the ensemble of Erdos Renier graphs. And for this, remember that what uh, we left the derivation yesterday at the following point, right? So we have that the the nth power of the partition function for the mapping average over the disorder, this was equal to what? This was equal to the integral for the product of alpha from 1 to n of d n x alpha of the exponential of minus z divided by 2, the sum for for alpha from 1 to small n, the sum for i from 1 to capital N of xi alpha square plus d divided by 2n, the complete sum of i and j from 1 to n of the exponential of the scalar product in replica space of xi xj minus 1. Yeah. So far, so good. So we were here, right? And then I, we, we discussed the trick in the in the, the trick of to, of how to linearize this to be able to get into an expression where I can, I can apply the side point method. That's the trick. Okay. So let me let me let's focus on this. Okay. Let's do it a step by step. So and actually, I'm going to do, to do it a bit more general. So suppose I have something like this. I have the sum of i and j from 1 to n is the complete sum of a function, doesn't matter the function, in this case it's exponential minus 1, of x vector in replica space i and x vector in replica space j. Right? This is what I have there. Do you agree? So this, I do the following. I, I say this is equal to the integral over a vector in replica space uh, dy of the sum of i and j from 1 to n of f of y vector in replica space x j in replica space times the Dirac delta of y minus xi. Do you agree that I have, I have not done, I have done nothing, right? <laughs> Very good. And I do it again, okay, for the other variable. So now this is equal to the integral over y. Let's put now y prime if you want, of the sum of i and j from 1 to n of f y vector in replica space, y vector prime in replica space, Dirac delta of y minus x i, Dirac delta of y prime minus x. Yeah. What's up? Um, I just, I, I just have like, um, I don't see that this is y. Now we have y and x, which are continuous variables, but then you need to integrate over delta, direct delta, and a conical delta with a sum. Yeah, normally, I, I, so si, since the, okay, maybe I should have been more careful with this. When you have discrete variables, it's better to use conical deltas for continuous variables, direct deltas, right? But here, y but the, because y are, because in this case, y are continuous variables, right? In the, in the example of this model, there were discrete variables. They, they would take values plus minus ones, and you have a vector in replica space of minus plus ones. In this case, they are continuous variables. So this guy here, yeah, 
this guy here, that the notation is y, uh, y1 to yn, y alpha belongs to r, right? It's a continuous model. But that's the meaning of X. Remember that when we do the mapping yeah. for the spectral density of the partition function, the partition function in this case were continuous variables, not discrete variables. Yeah? So in the mapping, this was related, I'm not going to write the whole expression, was related to a partition function that had continuous variables. It was the integral. Shall I write it down? Maybe yes, no? The integral of d and x, let me put it this way, of the exponential of minus one half of uh -huh. set identity matrix minus c x. So these are continuous variables. But again, so I'm a bit sloppy with Kronecker deltas and Dirac deltas. Maybe I should, I should, I should be more, more careful. But the, the property you, you use is the same. Like for instance, here. And using this property that if I if I integrate over the Dirac delta, I go back to this. this. And before, you know, if, if this would be a, a spin variables, I would have, for instance, let's write down the same thing, right? For these spin variables. Suppose I have this. Yeah? So then I will, what I will write is sums, no? I will write the sum over tau then the sum for i and j from 1 to n. I put here f of a tau vector in replica space, sigma j. And I'll put, I'll put here a chronicle delta of tau sigma, sigma i. But I think I'm using the same trick, the same property of the chronicle delta of the direct. It's due to the mapping. Very good. More questions? All right, so, so then you see this is a complete double sum, so I can put the sum over i over here, the sum over j over here, right? So then I'll have the following. I'll have the double integral for y vector, y prime vector of this function f y, y prime. Let me put it like this, no? I'm going to put here an n square. And here I'm going to put 1 over n, the sum over i from 1 to n of the Dirac delta of y minus xi times 1 over n, the sum of i from 1 to n, the Dirac delta of y prime minus x vector in the space j. So I have not done anything actually yet. Good. So if I come, come here, yeah, so this, this is generic, right? And now my function would be this exponential minus 1. So I can do this trick here. So I have that this is equal to the integral for the product of alpha from 1 to n, the n x vector index alpha of the exponential of minus z divided by 2, sum for alpha from 1 to a small n, sum i from 1 to an x i alpha square plus n d divided by 2. And then I have the double integral for d vector in replica, i vector in replica space, i prime vector in replica space. I'll have a exponential of the product of y with y prime minus 1. That multiplies, let me put it here, these two sums, right? I have. 1 over n, the sum of i from 1 to n, Dirac delta of y minus x i times 1 over n, the sum over, actually this would be j, but it's a dummy variable, okay, it doesn't matter. The sum over j from 1 to n of the Dirac delta of y prime minus x j. Okay, yeah, so far so good.
So this now would be the equivalent of the this magnetization that appeared in the example of the fully connected icing model. What I need to do is to introduce a, a Dirac delta for this whole object, and that would be the functional Dirac delta. I have to introduce a Dirac delta for each value of y. Okay, so this, now I can write it as follows. Go ahead. That's right. That's right. Uh, and then it's only for the fully connected Ising model that you use the magnetization. Yeah, because you only need one parameter in this case, okay. one, one one value. For the easy model on random graphs, you need a, a whole function. Okay. Yeah. Good. So this is equal to an integral or a path integral over a, a, a set of a set of functions p the integral for the product of alpha from 1 to n of d n x alpha. And then I have the exponential of minus z divided by 2, the sum over alpha from 1 to n, the sum over i from 1 to capital N x i alpha square, plus n d divided by 2, the integral over dy, y prime of p y p y prime that multiplies the exponential of y scalar product with y prime minus one uh, times a functional Dirac delta that means a Dirac delta for all possible possible values of this function p that tells you oh, sorry that tells you that p of x must be equal to what you are removing or you are extracting from the argument of the exponential, minus 1 over n, the sum of phi from 1 to n of Dirac delta of x minus x i. Okay, so that if, if I were to do the path integral and use the functional Dirac delta, I would replace p that appears here by this expression and I go back and I have this double sum for i and j. Again, the trick, the trick in the spirit is the same. The object you apply to is a bit more complicated. Right, now what I do, I introduce the free representation of this functional Dirac delta that would be the free representation for each value that this function can take. Right, so let me call the conjugate variable, p, a, d, p hat, and then I have a path integral for p and p hat of the integral for alpha from 1 to n of d n x alpha of exponential, exponential of minus z divided by 2, the sum over alpha from 1 to a small n, the sum of i from 1 to capital N of x i alpha square, plus this stays the same, y y prime, p y p y prime, that multiplies the exponential of y, the scalar product y prime minus 1. And I put now the Fourier of this, the Fourier representation of this. This would be a i n, the integral over dx of p hat of x that multiplies p of x minus 1 over n, the sum of i from 1 to n of the Dirac delta x minus xi. And this is already inside the argument of the exponential. Huh? The same trick, the object is a bit more complicated, but it's the, sorry, it's the bloody same trick. Yeah? And then the beauty of these steps, the beauty of this trick is now, so you see this, you have here a quadratic sum, and now you have only linear sums in the, in the node variables. So, so here I have a linear sum, and here I have a linear sum. So that means now I can factorize 
per the variables per node, per node and I can do the trace for those variables. The same as the example of the fully connected ESIM model. So, so let us rearrange a bit this expression here. What do I have is the following. What do I have is I'm going to move uh, some terms around. Okay, so I have the path integral for d uh, dp d p hat of the exponential of what? Of uh, d n divided by two, the double integral over y and over y prime of p y p y ha, uh, prime. That multiplies the exponential of the scalar product with y, y prime minus 1. Right? This would be this term here. This one. Then I have this term here, I'm going to put here as well. Plus i n, the integral over the x, p hat x, p x. Right? And then the others, I put them together with this part because I'm going to do it. Tell me. That's fine. Just remember, like, where, uh, why the, uh, the square root of the two pi in the product uh, dn it, it is there hidden, yeah? In this, in this measure is hidden there, these factors which are not, are not important. And even before, it even before yes. Have the one of the of the yeah, 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 so you should be, when you do the derivation, you should be exquisite with the, with the derivation, so in principle, Okay, what I'm going to write down, this is not really correct, but for discrete variables, the way, for discrete variables, when, when, when we wrote this thing for this model, this is what actually meant is was the product for all possible values of sigma in the upper lattice of values minus one, one, okay, of the P, yeah? And this, the P hat, meant the same thing. divided by 2 pi over n, right? Do they cancel each other in the end? Is no, they don't cancel each other. Or it's just uh, because it takes on the derivative because I put like this. No, no, with path integrals it's a bit annoying because now you don't have a discrete variable, you have continuous, so this will be something to the power infinity, so it doesn't make sense. Okay. So the way you do it with continuous variables is that you regularize, you discretize the values of the functions, and then at some point you, you make the continuous limit without caring about these factors that are not coupled to important functions, but they give you infinity in, infinity in this continuous limit. So this nastiness, which is irrelevant, I put it, is hidden here, right? So what I call, what I call this is the product of these two things. You, if you want, you can also put the two pi, but remember that in the mapping, the relationship in, between the spectral density and the logarithm is by the derivative of the log of the partition function, the log of, a, then you have that's this constant. constant derivative is zero, right? Okay. So that's why I don't, I don't write it anymore. But if you want, write it and realize that in some cases, some constants are not important, and in other cases, they are. Can you, the last question? <laughs> sure. Hey. Yeah, for the same reason I mentioned before. So if you want, don't put the don't put the, the n. Do the standard for the representation of the Dirac delta, and then you go you do the whole calculation I'm going to do. Then you, know you apply the solid point method, and you realize that pit hat pit hat must be proportional to n to have an untrivial solution. Since all these derivations are the same, you know that the Conjugate variable that appears when you put uh, the Fourier representation of the Dirac delta must be always proportional to n. That's why I put it from the beginning, because half the power of uh, foreseeing what is going to happen. And then you should, like, because our um, conjugate variable is n p hat, this is why you have two pi over n, right? Yeah. But if we if we do the, the real Dirac delta in this case, not the discrete case, the continuous one, then if we do this, we have n p hat. Uh, we have just hey. So we should have over two pi. So we don't have 
any more to pi over n. So then if we take the limit, the continuous limit, do we still have the same result? Do you see what I mean? No, I mean, if you take the continuous limit, you, you still have a problem, but it's a, it's a trivial problem that you have a constant that goes to infinity. So you see, if, uh, if, if this were for continuous variables, if this would be for, the, for actually those functions, what you do? You regularize or you discretize the values of x, like if, if you were to do integral, right? So then this plot I wrote here is well-defined, okay? You do everything with this uh, discretization, and then you, make the, you take the, the continuous limit. So what would happen is like here, sums would go to integrals, you will have this, but then you have an issue with this factor. Because this factor would be 2p two, uh, two divided by n to something that, to a power that goes to infinity. But if we don't have the divided by n, we take the Well, it doesn't matter. You have the factor still 2 pi. Ah. The n is not important for what I'm saying. Ah, so the factor to, you have the whole factor to a given power that goes to infinity when you take the continuous limit. Okay. Yeah? Very good. More questions? Go ahead. Sorry? The differential of d. Here. No, it's, it's, it's just notation. What I'm saying is that this, yeah, this, what it means is this. Okay. This, what it means is, is this. The product of here. Yeah. What's what's happening with this one? No, 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 no. This is uh, okay. So this is just to uh, to indicate that the product is is only affecting this part. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it's, I'm I'm I'm, up, I'm reusing same symbols. Okay. So why don't we do the following? Use here uh, this, to not to be confused with this. But this only thing it means is like I'm, the, the product is affecting to this part. It's not the same notation. Yeah? Better? You see, I want to put here these square brackets because if I would not put that, people might think that this product affect, affects everything that is in front of it. This square brackets is to just to, to point out that this product only affects this expression here. This is the only thing it, it, it means. Yeah? Very good. More questions? Go ahead. So if we had it, not mathematically well defined. Speak up. So if we had it, not mathematically well but, but there is a there is a, there is a procedure to make, to make it well be, be uh, uh, well uh, well defined, okay? Which is you discretize, like in you do uh, in Riemann integrals, and then you do the whole process for discrete x, and at the end you take the continuous limit. Yeah. Question. Repeat the derivation, what you have in mind? Sorry? Can you repeat what you have in mind? How yes, do you? We have, okay, before this step, we had uh, sums of deltas. Sums of deltas? Yes. These ones here? Yes. Yeah. They were outside, and now sure. we put them, we like cluster them inside this delta. This yeah. Delta, right? But what would happen is like you go, uh, you, you undo the, the derivation you are doing. No, because the, the sum is still there, right? So how can you put outside? So, so you see, so at some point, 
inside the argument of the exponential, I have the following. I have the integral, again, over y, y prime, of the exponential of y, the scalar product with y prime minus 1. And here I have 1 over n, the sum i from 1 to n of this. times 1 over n, the sum for j from 1 to n of chronic Dirac delta of y prime xj. Yeah, and this is inside the argument of the exponential. And you, you are saying what? So still I have the double sum. What I want to do is to get rid of the double sum. So if you, you I mean, if you multiply everything, what is going to happen, and then you use the Dirac deltas, you are going to recover the expression we are trying to avoid. Yeah? Very good. More questions? Come on, don't be shy. More questions? Go ahead. You don't understand the last equation. This one here? No, but I, I had not finished to write down. It's because when I was writing, somebody, somebody asked me something, so I didn't finish it. Can I finish now? <laughs> Very good. Very good. So as I was saying, what I'm doing now is to reorder the terms. So I put the path integral over these two functions, what this thing means, what I tell you it means. Right? And what I'm missing is, still, I'm missing this term here and this term here. Okay? So then I have... Now, the product, well, this is multiplying the integral over uh, the product for alpha from 1 to n of the n uh, x alpha. And then I have uh, the exponential of z divided by 2 of the sum for alpha from 1 to n, the sum i from 1 to capital N of x i alpha squared. And now you see I have the term, this term here, with the sum and the Dirac delta. So I can use the Dirac delta to do the integral. And then the 1 over n will cancel this n. And this will give me minus i, the sum of i from 1 to n of p hat xi. And this is the same step, you know, in spirit, mathematically speaking, as in when we, in the, like in the fully connected IC model, where now everything is linear in, in, in nodes, in dynamical variables, and now we can factorize and do the trace, right? Because now this term I can do as follows, right? So I'll have here the path integrals for pp hat. And then I have this part here. Let us do it step by step. D divided by n, sorry, dn divided by 2, the double integral over y, y <coughs> prime, py, p, y prime, minus 1 plus i, n, this integral, p hat x, px. And then this, so you see this, I can rewrite it as follows, right? I can re rewrite it as this multiple integral, but now I change the order I, I see this, uh, these differentials. I put this as the product of i from 1 to n of the x vector in replica space i of the exponential of minus z divided by 2 of so sum over alpha, sum over i from 1 to capital N alpha from 1 to number of replicas N of x i alpha I square minus i sum of i from 1 to n p hat x vector i. And now all this factorized per i. Okay? Uh, I think uh, if the differential is big, small, n, it's Sorry? It's, it's capital N. No, but in the big. In the? In the big. Ah, to keep the notation, yeah. Put it like this. Fantastic. Very good. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So now this factorizes per side, right? So this is equal to what? Mm. 
ね。This is equal to the same thing as before. This path integral over p over p hat of uh, exponential of again this same piece. Let us do it step by step. Dn divided by two, the double integral over y y prime. Py, Py prime, exponential of y, the scalar product with y prime minus 1, plus i n, the integral over, if you want ddx, but okay, uh, p hat x, px, and this now is what? This is the product of i from 1 to n of the integral over dn x i of the exponential of set uh, minus set divided by 2 x vector in the space squared i minus i by hat x i. Repeat, uh, speak up. P of y and P of y prime, right? Y prime, thank you. Yeah. And this is the same integral n times, right? So therefore, this is equal to this integral to the power n that I, I can put inside the argument of the exponential as plus. Uh, plus n uh, plus n times the log of this, and that's it. Good. Better. More or less. I mean, the way to learn the calculation is to do the bloody calculation. There's, there is no other way, right? So I manage to go to a situation where I'm very happy. Why? Because an extremely complicated object, which was what? Which was the, the partition function to the power n average over the disorder. At the end of the day, I can write it as some weird integral, it's a path integral of the exponential of n, a functional that depends on these two functions, p and p hat. Where this functional is precisely the one that I have there without the n, no? With this n of p and p hat is equal to what? It's equal to i. Uh, the integral of dx, p hat x, px, plus d divided by 2, the double integral over y, y prime, py, py prime, that multiplies the exponential of the scalar product of y with y prime minus 1. plus the log of this, no? plus the logarithm of the integral of dx. If you want, you, you can put here d and x, okay, to keep all the notation sane, okay, consistency, but okay, just, when you do the derivation, just be careful uh, and consistent with the notation. Exponential of set divided by 2, x vector in replica space squared minus i p hat x. as promise. So now, why this is cool? Because from the definition, this, if you look at it, is something very, very difficult to evaluate. While this, if I'm interested in the asymptotic behavior of the partition function, when the size of the matrix, you know, is very, very large, I don't know, independent of how complicated and how poorly defined the path integral is, the idea of the side point method also applies. 
So I don't have to do the path integral. That's the cool thing about it. So for enlarge, this behaves like the exponential of n, and then this functional evaluated at the points where at the functions p0 and p hat naught, we extremize the, the, this, fun, this functional. So that's why at the end of the day, I don't care about, I'm not being particularly careful whether with the factors in the path integral because I know that in this case, if you worry about asymptotic behavior of n, I don't have to do those integrals. Questions? So this was the first part of the exercise. Now the second part was, well, was what are the values of P0, uh, P0 and P hat 0? So remember these are the functions here, uh, P0 x and P hat not x are the solutions uh, to the saddle point equations. And these are the equations are equations that come from minimizing this functional of P and P, P hat. Okay, so that means you take now the, 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 the variation of S with respect to P equal to zero, Sn, and the variation of Sn with respect to P hat equal to zero, and you obtain a couple of a couple of couple equations that relate P P naught with P naught hat. Good. Questions? No, how you do this derivation by doing it. So the, only thing, the only thing you have to know when you do calculus of variations is the following trick. The first is that essentially when you do the variation of something it has the same properties as the normal derivative. And the other one is that the variation, for instance, of Px with respect to P x prime, this is the Dirac delta of x x prime. That's the only trick you need to know, the only property you need to know cool to the derivation. And, and if you do it, what you obtain, let us do it, is the following, right? You obtain that, um, so let me see, you obtain that minus P hat of x zero is T, the integral over y, P P zero y that multiplies the scalar product of x with y minus one. This comes from doing the uh, variation with respect a uh, uh, p that affects here and here, right? And then when you do the variation with respect p hat, you obtain that p naught of x is equal to the exponential of minus z divided by two x square minus i p naught x divided by the same integrator, right? The integral over y exponential of minus z divided by two y square minus i p naught p naught hat y. And the derivation from this is, is, is rather straightforward. Did you manage to get, what time is it? Did you manage to get this, to get these equations? I guess so. I guess you managed to do it. Yeah? Now. Ah, it's okay. Now, let me delete all this, or maybe this part here. Or actually, this part below. And let us notice something, uh, something that is very important as well, right? So remember the mapping. The mapping uh, tells, uh, told us that the average spectral density was equal to what? Was equal to minus 2 divided by pi n. Uh, ba, 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 the imaginary part, well, uh, minus 2 divided by pi n, the limit of eta going to 0 plus of the imaginary part of the derivative with respect to set of the limit 
of n going to zero of one over n, the logarithm of the partition function to the power n, average over the disorder when set is equal to lambda minus i eta. Right? Good. Now, if you are interested in the asymptotic behavior of the spectral density, that means when n is very large, you know, the average replicative partition function behaves in this way. If you can plug now, now in this, this part into here, the logarithm would cancel the exponential, n cancels the, this n here, and then you have to do the derivative with respect to set, if you want, of, the, of this functional. If you do it and use the side point equations, you should get the following. Okay, you should get that this is equal to um, limit of eta going to zero plus of one divided by pi of the imaginary part of the limit of n going to zero of one over n, the integral over dx, p zero x, and the sum for alpha from one to n of x alpha squared. Why do you get this? Well, because when I do the derivative uh, of this function with respect to set, you know, I deleted, but it was in the part of the logarithm. The logarithm of the integral of this object here. When you do the derivative, the logarithm will give you the denominator, this and this in front, but at the side point, this object is precisely p0 P0x. Yeah. Well, now, tell me. But also, we have tended to the Very good, very good. That's right. So you see, the, the, the side point solutions also depend on set through the side point equations, right? So when you do the derivative of the functional with respect to set, you have an explicit dependence and an implicit dependence through the functions. So to, to, to do the derivation with respect to the implicit dependence, you have to do the variation of the action with respect to p and p hat. But the variation of the action with respect to p and p hat is zero because these are the solutions of, of the side point, at the side point, right? So you only need to worry about the explicit dependence on set, on c. Good. Now, step two of the replica method. So, which means how on earth I do, the, I do the limit of n going to zero, right? So let us look at this object that we have here. Let us forget about the imaginary part and the limit of eta going to zero plus. So we have the limit of n going, going to zero of one over n, the integral over dx, p zero of x, the sum alpha from one, n of x alpha square. So an n is integer before doing the limit, right? And what is n? Well, it's here in the sum. So it's kind of a bit we are taking this an integer and making it real in the sum, right? And then it's also uh, hidden here, no? So p0 of x vector is actually p0 of a vector having n components, x1, x2, up to xn. So it's, really, it's very difficult to see from this expression how to make the limit of the dimension of a, of a space going to zero and evaluate this expression, right? Do you agree with me that this is, looks like an impossible task? Yeah, okay. So the idea is the following. So you do the following observation that, that consists on realizing that when I want to do, when I want to derive the typical properties with respect to randomness due to the graphs, I do this trick of having a partition function, 
a set uh, of C of set, and I multiply it n times, right? So it's set to the power n, right? So this is actually what it is with n integers. So this is set, let me take out, let me pull simply set, okay? This is set times set times set up to n times, right? And then you call this thing the nth replicas or copies of the system. And then you say, okay, I'm going to call uh, the system related to this partition function, the first copy of the first replica. This would be the first copy for the first replica of the system. This would be the second copy, third copy, and the, la the last one is the nth copy. Right? But there is no reason to call this one the first, this one the second, this one the third, because these this variables, this, they commute, right? So I could call this one the, 20, the, the 24th, 17, first, third, seven, etc., etc. So that means that if after the, the, at the end of my, my calculation, I, su I should expect that the, what I obtain must be invariant under the exchange of replicas. Because at the beginning, I put the replicas in, uh, independently, right? So at the beginning, in this derivation, the replicas or the copies are independent. So I, I expect, in principle, that my theory, after doing the average over the disorder, etc., must keep this symmetry, okay? And then you say that the theory, or the resulting theory, must be independent under the relabeling, the relabeling of replicas, of replicas, right? So if I were labeled the alphas, nothing should change, right? Because at the beginning I put them independent. Or in more, in more fancy ways, you say that uh, your solution must be invariant under the permutation of replicas, right? My objects in the theory must be invariant under permutation of re replicas. Yeah. Everybody agree with this observation? Right, so that means that this object that appears at the end of this very nasty and bloody calculation should have this property that when I change two components of this vector in the replica space, they should, it should give me the same, right? This hypothesis or ansatz is called replica symmetric ansatz. This is what is called, let me delete there. This is what is called the replica symmetric ansatz. <sighs> this is called replica symmetric ansatz. And this is, going, this, is, this is going to be the hypothesis that will allow me to make this limit of n going to zero, right? But at least you have to understand the motivation of this. The motivation is a simple observation that this was some kind of artificial construction. There is no reason why, you know, the, 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 the label I put in each copy should, should be important. So therefore, my final theory should be invariant under this labeling, right? Now, the question now is, uh, which form has to have this x0 that captures this replica symmetry? Yeah? They ask called this object now. This object is now the solution of the side point, but I, have, I want to impose this invariance under the permutation of replicas. They ask called this in p0 in replica symmetric ansatz. And in this took a while to, to understand. Let me write it down, okay? For this particular case, for this mapping, the format this guy should have is the following. It's an integral over a parameter capital delta of a density of deltas of the product of alpha from one to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by two 
delta divided by the square root of 2 pi, 2 pi delta, right? This is the most general form you have for replica symmetric answers. Question? Well, okay, so, <laughs> very good question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, this is kind of funny because you can, you can motivate or you can argue that this must be the correct expression if you try to relate cavity method with replica method. And the deltas that appear in the cavity method are, are related to these deltas that appear here. Okay? Then you can try to try other things. Like, for instance, how can I be assured that this is symmetric under the permutation of replicas? We can try s some things. Like, for instance, one possibility would be the following. Okay, I can, I can, I can assume one possibility. Let's call our, our replica symmetric ansatz. Our replica symmetric ansatz, why not? That uh, this joint distribution for this, uh, of this vector in the replica space is just the product, right, of simple distributions. I can do, I could do something like this. Let's put now like Q zero of X alpha, and let us say that this distribution will depend on some parameters, right? And let us assume that the parameters depend on alpha. You'll see. So let us assume that this distribution for uh, for Replica alpha depends on parameters alpha. And actually, let us, let us write it down explicitly. This would be Q0 of x1 uh, uh, delta 1 times Q0 of x2 delta 2 up to Q0 of xn delta n. So it is clear that this is not symmetric under the permutation of replicas. Why? Because even though it factorizes the parameters I put here, these are the parameters that parameterize the, for instance, in a Gaussian would be the variance, the mean value, et cetera, right? So these are the parameters that, that parameterize the distribution. If I change the indices, the parameters change. So that means this is not replica, replica symmetric. So the only, the, the, only form for, the, only, the, the only way for this to be replica symmetric is that all parameters are the same, yeah? Do you agree with me? And now you can generalize this thing to say, okay, maybe these parameters, they have some uncertainty. So this can be lifted up to say, okay, so I have the product of this product is conditioned to a given value of delta, yeah, times the integral over all possible values of that delta. And that, that gives back this, okay? So this can be lifted up saying, okay, this is a condition to a given parameter, so then I can Suppose that this parameter follows a distribution, yeah, and then I have this product. If Matteo were here, is Matteo here? No. If Matteo were here, he would say, ah, this is called the Finetti's theorem, right? And he will leave it in the air, and you'll say, okay, thank you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you understand that, okay, so, so what, this would be a, a good trial but it still is missing some possible information that this delta can be undetermined, yeah? And actually this captures this case when this density is a direct delta, okay? So this is the most general uh, replica symmetric order parameter. Or, you know, uh, you, don't, uh, you don't see it, but you, don't, you believe me for the time being, I, I can continue, yeah? And I can try to motivate later, tell me. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, something like this. And actually, again, this can be motivated. Uh, this can be related to the cavity method, actually. But I, I will not have time to do that. But if you're interested, we can do it in a, in a lecture on Saturday. Right? I'm going to be here the, for the rest of the college, actually. Yeah? Now, OK, suppose that, oh, go ahead. You have to speak up. What is the order parameter? Yes. Yeah, okay. There is a reason that normally uh, to, the, to these parameters, I call them order parameters. Okay, remember that in, in critical phenomena, order parameters are called to this value that is zero in one phase and different from zero in another phase, and then it varies continuously at the, at the transition point, yeah? So in the, in the, in the ferromagnet, for instance, the order parameter is, is the magnetization. Now, mathematically, the magnetization appears when you decouple this size, when you linearize this double sum, right? as we saw in this, this fully connected IC model. 
So normally in my area, uh, you call order parameters the object you have to introduce to go to linearize this double sum. Yeah? Now, can, be also be, can, can also this be understood as an order parameter? Yes, because uh, of course it's not, it's not going to be zero or different from, from zero when you, when you go from one phase to the other because this is a density, so it cannot, cannot be zero. Yeah? But its form will change. And if you look at the, how the form changes, you can also locate transitions. Good? Ah, definitely. Okay, maybe I'm going to. Uh, the call is the uh, fi ne I think it's with two t's. Definitely. It, it, it makes sense, but then why the condition of immobility is a dosing? Ah, yes. It, it's because I said that this is the 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 other solution for our case for this problem in uh, in random matrices. Okay. In, yeah. In principle, I should I should have here an infinite number of parameters, and I would know that this is a Gaussian. But for our problem, I know that this, this distribution for each component in, in, in replica space must be a Gaussian. All right? Here, okay, very, very good. This is very good because when we did this derivation, so what happens when the people or Gina did these derivations, right, they put, this, this a generic expression like this, right? They put something like, they would put something like this, right? Let me delete this. They would put like an integral over infinite number of parameters. This, this mu is an infinite number of parameters, right? Of a density over an infinite, infinite number of parameters of the product for single marginals per cavity variable x alpha, that depends of an infinite number of parameters. Yeah? You apply, you put this thing into the saddle point equations, and then you, write, you obtain cell consistency equations for these omegas of mu. And you realize that for our problem, only the variance, one, one parameter is important, the other ones are zero. Like it, like it happened when we wrote down the cavity equations for the cavity marginals for our problem and realized that the uh, that the Gaussians are the ones which are a fixed point for those equations. But the, the most generic solution expression would be this. Go ahead. Can you speak up? This delta can be interpreted as a, like an order parameter in this system. For this mapping of random matrices, I don't see, I don't see how. For, for instance, for the EC model on random graphs, yes, because this parameter would be actually this parameter for the EC model of, of uh, for the EC model of random graphs on Poissonian graphs would be, for instance, the the cavity the cavity fields. Okay, and the available tangent of the cavity fields would be the cavity magnetizations, and those are this can be understood as order parameters, right? Very good. Can I continue now? Okay, now what what I want to argue? So, no, I can, can I continue? Ah, sorry, go ahead. Let me see you. For our case, for our case, for for our problem, which is no, 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 no. The people, the, it was not. This was not realized. It's because when you write down, you have to put guys, you have to put this expression back to the side point. You remember that uh, for when we have the cavity equations for the cavity marginals in this problem, what we did is to say, okay, I I realized that the cavity marginals have to be to be Gaussians, I plug that, that thing into there, and then I get the cavity equations for the deltas, right? So here you have to do something similar. I have to introduce this expression into the cell phone equations and, and then write equations for these for this omegas, for these densities. You write that, and then you realize that the only densities that work are those densities related to the variances when these are Gaussians. And the observation is the same thing we did for the cavity method. You find equations 
uh, you find integrals for, this, for these objects, and you realize that these objects, if they are Gaussians, they are a fixed point from a functional point of view of these integrals. But you have to do the derivation to see it. Yeah. So this would be uniform Gaussian, uh, what do you mean by uniform Gaussian? I don't understand that. The probability of having, for example, H1, H2, right? The probability of having what? If, if the system is, uh, we have two variables. Yeah. Is the probability of having H1, H2. If we see the probability density, a kind of. Yes. So you have your Gaussian. Yeah. You say I do an average of all the possible variances of this. Yeah. Yeah. No, something that might might not be Gaussian, but the, this 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 issue that I uh, that I mentioned that it closes under Gaussian is not for this guy here; it's for these guys here, right? So we realize that if you put Gaussian uh, densities here, the equations close for these marginals, okay. and then this density for these parameters they obey something which is not Gaussian at all. That I will not have time to derive it, but I'll, I'll send you the notes. Uh, okay, so we yeah. can derive it. So to get yeah. this density, we do something else. Yeah. And what, like, uh, the general idea of what we do is. The general idea of what, sorry? What we do to derive this density. Because well, so yeah. as I said, so you go to the, you, you know that this obey a side point equation. Well, two, but you can combine and you have a side point equation for this, right? Mm -hmm. So you plug this expression over there. Yeah. And in the replica limit and going to zero, you will, you will find closed equations for this. Ah, okay. But the derivation is not trivial and it's not easy to. I mean, I cannot explain to you. We have to do it to see how it appears. Okay. What, what did you find out for this P not hat? What would be what? Ah, you, you can you can do you can do the same answers if you want. Of course, in this case, it, it is not a density. So for instance, this, then the corresponding omega hat for this case will not be a density. Or since you can combine the two side point equations and to have only one side point equation for this one. Right? Doesn't matter. So replica symmetric answers for this imply replica symmetric answers for, for p, p hat. Yeah? More questions? You got to, sorry? You got to convince. Ah, OK, OK. Yeah, yeah, no. Every, everybody got uh, very convinced in, the, in 75, and then something was noted in 75, and then nobody knew how to sort it out, and then it took 30 years to understand, right? So this is a very convincing argument. Unfortunately, for, for these mappings with random matrices, replica symmetric answer works. But for spin glass models, it doesn't work. And this is something very strange. So it happens that actually replica symmetry is broken. And you have to break it in a specific way to capture the thermodynamical properties of spin glasses. But can you do really well, actually? Because we understand why. Yeah, we do. Yes. Yeah, we do. And, only, and for some models, it was proof mathematically that uh, the way you, uh, you, you break replica symmetry, which is, it is by the Parisi scheme, gives you the exact solution for certain models. Okay. Yeah? Just to be clear, uh, where we said the indefinite sentence is when we say that the probability can be uh, divided. So there is a few. No, the in, ah, no, the in, yeah, no, no, this, this was a way. Yes, but then also, uh, well, the permutation is when we say that all the parameters should be the same. Yeah, there must be the same because. Yeah, if they are not the same, if I permit to, to replicas, then I obtain something different, right? Yeah. So then all the parameters must be the same. I just want to be clear where we are introducing the, the symmetry. Yes, because obviously this is a broken and the That's right. That's right. So it's in the parameters. Yes. Yeah. It's in the product. It's in the fact that the joint distribution of this vector in replica space is the product for each component. Right of this uh, of this marginal for each component, and then the parameters that parameterize each marginal they have to be the same. Yeah, 
And actually, this is, was very difficult to, so this expression was very difficult at the beginning to understand. So the first, uh, the first people who wrote, the, uh, who wrote the replica symmetric answers for this order parameter, they did it in this way, which is the incorrect way. Yeah? Or the most, it's a particular case. This was done in 1985 in a paper of Michael Wong and David Sherrington when they tried to solve a, a, a combinatorial optimization problem relating that to a spin glass problem. Yeah. More questions? Now, going back to, okay, you said, you, you said this argument is very convincing, right? So how you convince, so how can you unconvince yourself? So you take the, so the people realize, so the way the people realize that this couldn't be correct, and then there was a lot of argument where the, that where was the source of the, of, the, of the problem, of the mistake, is that if you use replica symmetric answers for the, for the paradigm, paradigmatic model, the spin glass model, which is the SK model, the Sherlin torkin kilpatrick model, and you study the entropy, when the entropy goes to zero, the entropy becomes negative. And this cannot be for discrete variables. Right? So then something was wrong, but if you look at the paper of the Shetland and Kirkpatrick, they thought that what was incorrect was that you have to exchange the replica limit with the thermodynamic limit. But the replica symmetric was, answers was correct. Because it's, it's weird, no? Again, so the replicas are independent. All right? And then there was, a, there was a French author that introduced a way to break replicas, and then George introduced a better way, et cetera, et cetera. More questions? Okay, now, I hope I managed to convince you that this would be a proper, well, the, the one I wrote before, let's do it again, a proper parameter in replica symmetric ansatz. So again, for our case, this is the integral over a parameter of a density of that parameter of the product for alpha from one to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by two uh, delta divided by the square root of two pi delta. Now, how can I use now this, this ansatz, to make the replica limit? Well, now what happens is like that when you plug this ansatz into here, you know, the, uh, you, uh, the, uh, the values of n appear explicitly and then you can do the limit very easily. Let us do it, right? Now, the limit of n going to zero of one divided by n of the integral of dx of, now this p naught, I'm going to put it in replica symmetric ansatz, of the integral over delta omega delta, the product of alpha from one to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by two delta, divided by square root of uh, two p delta, and then I have the sum for beta from one to n of x beta square. Yeah? So this would be equal to what? So let us see, so let's do it like this. So this would be equal to the integral over delta, d delta, omega delta, and then I have the limit of n going to zero of one over n, and then I have the integral over dx of this, right? Or let's, let's look like this, of the sum for beta from one to n of the integral of dx, the product of alpha from one to n of the exponential of minus x alpha squared divided by two delta, divided by the square root of two pi delta, of x, alpha, x beta square, right? So when I do, for a given value of beta, I do the integrals for all the components of x which are not beta, yeah? And then I have the integral over dx beta of the Gaussian weight x beta square. This would be delta. And then this sum goes from one to n, and you'll have the same value for all values of beta, right? So this is equal to what? This is equal to the integral over d delta, omega delta, the limit 
n going to 0, 1 over n, and then I'll have n times the same thing, all right? n times the integral over x of the exponential of uh, minus x squared divided by 2 delta divided by the square root of 2 pi delta of x squared. So now n appears explicitly, right? No, it doesn't appear as the components of a vector. It doesn't appear as the last element of a sum. It doesn't appear anywhere else. It appears explicitly as the integer. And now you say, ah, no, I, I can take the limit, no? <laughs> In this case, so you have n divided by n, which is 1. And then this will give you what? The integral of delta of omega delta delta. All right. Questions? Go ahead. Yeah, because you see, so so for a given value of beta, yeah, you do the, the integral over all components in this vector which are not beta. See, this is a Gaussian distribution. This would give you one, and, and only the component when the component of x when it's beta will remain. And then you have the integral over x beta, right? Of this with x beta, x beta squared. But this is the same value for all sum for beta from 1 to 1. Don't worry. Let's do, it. Let's do one more step. Yeah. One more step and that's it, right? So, so this part, so you agree with me that here I have an integral, multi, a multidimensional integral in replica space, yeah? And I'm going to do the integrals over all components, but not the component beta, yeah? Not the component beta. Because I have to do, because the component, uh, the integral over beta is different than the rest. Like beta, is one of the eh? beta is one of the replicas. But here I have all the replicas. Okay, so let, let's do it step by step. I have the following, right? I have uh, the integral over dx1, dx2, dx beta, dxn, right? Of the exponential of x1 squared divided by 2 delta divided by the square root of 2 pi delta. I'm sorry, I'm only copying the part which is important. This is not equal to, okay? I'm just focusing, focusing that piece. Times, and here we'll have x beta squared divided by 2 delta divided by the square root of 2 pi delta up to uh, exponential of minus x n squared divided by 2 delta divided by 2 pi delta. And here I have x beta squared. Yeah, you, are you with me? Now, I do the rest of the integrals, but don't the integral over beta. So the integral over this would be 1, right? Because this is Gaussian measure. All the integrals would be 1 except the integral over dx beta. So this would be the integral over d x beta exponential of minus x beta squared divided by 2 delta divided by square root of 2 pi delta x beta squared, right? And then, let me put here, I have the sum over beta from 1 to n. Here I have the sum over beta from 1 to n. This is the same result n times, no? And it's precisely delta. So this is equal to n times delta. So therefore, this gives me the integral over delta, omega delta, the limit n going to 0, 1 over n times m times delta. Better? Very good. Questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so what happens is the following. Well, remember, okay, so let us 
finish with the bank, okay? So this derivation is, again, these derivations are not difficult. It's, they are just annoying, right? Being annoying and being difficult is not the same thing, right? So let me, let me delete here. This part below. Maybe this part here. Now remember that the, this function obeyed and the other one, p hat obeyed a side point equation. You can put, combine both of them yeah, and to have just a one side point equation for, for p naught. This side point equation would be something like this. p naught of x is equal to the exponential of minus z divided by 2 x vector squared plus Second, that's right. D, the integral over y, p naught of y, exponential of a scalar product of x and y minus 1, and something in the denominator, which I'm not going to write. Actually, it's the trace of the one you have in the numerator. Yeah? Where are you? You have this Alpine equation, right? So what you have to do is to plug the RS ansatz in this Alpine equation. You have to rewrite it, make the limit n going to zero, and get cell consistency equations or closed equations for this omega of delta. When you do it, you realize that this omega of delta must obey the following equation. You have that. Omega of delta must be equal to the sum of the series for k from 0 to infinity of the exponential of minus d, uh, d to the k divided by k factorial, the multiple integral for l from 1 to k, d delta l omega. Uh, omega delta L, Dirac delta of delta must be equal to 1 divided by, and for our case, which is Poissonian graphs, is Z minus the sum for L from 1 to K of delta L. Tell me. If you, if, if you, if, okay, if you take the side point equations and then you take a generic replica symmetric ansatz, you get an expression which is much horrible, is much more horrible than this one, and you realize that this simplifies when, you know, these Qs were Gaussians, and you get this. And you are wondering, Isaac, how do you get this? Well, it's very simple. You plug this thing into here, you do a Taylor expansion of this, of the exponential of this, and then you plug this expression here, you massage, you, you apply the replica limit, and you obtain this. I'll send you the notes of this. Tell me. This is something like um, the, the, the mean value of, of, of the graph having. Yeah, something like that. Does, does this remind you of something? Yes. Of what? It was uh, similar to the one that we obtained. The cavity equations, right? So uh, what the replica mean limited captures is that you do the cavity equations for one graph, and then you do it for another graph, and you do it for an, no, another graph, et cetera, et cetera, and then you do the average over all graphs, and then you get the expectation value or the average of the cavity equations. And you, could, you can do this thing, it's a bit involved, and at the end of the day, you get this. Yeah, very good. This part here, this has a, a, actually a very uh, intuitive meaning for the problem we are, we are dealing with. This is related with the fact that for erdos Renyi graph, uh, the, the probability of finding the degree, uh, an with a given degree is a Poisson distribution, right? So what is this, the Poisson distribution? Yeah. 
you take a given graph, you solve the cavity uh, equations, you take another graph, and then for a given node, you say, what is the probability of this node has a certain degree? Yeah, and naturally, all this expression appears, but it's a bit involved to do it that way. Well, in the cavity method, okay, actually the precise relationship is the following, right? But again, to prove it, it's a bit involved, and there is no more time. So remember that in the cavity method, we have that the that the spectral density was given in terms of these variances, and the variances were related to other variances that way uh, cavity equations. The cavity equations were these ones. The variance, or this delta of i, when j has been removed, is equal to 1 divided by z. I'm going to do it directly for uh, connectivity matrices. z minus the sum for alpha belonging to the neighborhood of i without j of delta l I. Yeah? Now, what is the relationship between this and this? You do the following. You take, there are various ways to do it, but you can do it all, even in the same graph. You define in, a, in the context of the cavity method, the cavity method, you define the following. You do the histogram or the probability distribution for this cavity variances, right? So you do Dirac delta of delta minus delta without, at i without j. Then you do the sum uh, you do, that's right, that's right. So you do the sum for all i from 1 to n. And then you do the, actually you would do the sum for all i from 1 to n. You will do the sum for all j belonging to the neighborhood of i. You will divide by the number of neighbors of i, and you divide by 1 over n. So this object that appears naturally in the cavity method, which is just calculating somehow the probability of finding a given delta when you, when you treat when the graph is very large, or you do the average uh, over various graphs, you obtain precisely that this obeys this equation. Right. If you want, I can send you this at the end of the life, but I can send you some notes of how you derive this. Questions? Questions? Yeah, I, I don't really get why you use the cavity matrix here. Why do you use the cavity method, method here? It's simply, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, cavity method and replica method, they are related. And you see, the problem with replica method is it's a, it's a, it's a, mathema it's a very mathematical method. And it, it, you, you might think it doesn't have any kind of physical meaning. But since the two methods are somewhat related statistically, what I was trying to argue is that this equation that you obtain with the replica method can be derived with the, with the cavity method if you consider the expectation values over all possible graphs on the ensemble. It's, it's, it's simply that, right? Now, which method you are going to use, it depends. You know, some problems are very, are very easy to tackle with the replica method, while in the cavity method you don't, you don't have an idea how to do it. And in other cases, the, the cavity method is, 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 a, is better. Yeah? But the two, is in principle, should be equivalent. Sorry? This one, no, well, this comes from the replica method. Yeah, this comes from putting this uh, order parameter in replica symmetric Kansas in the style point equations and doing the, the derivations. I'll send you the notes, yeah? And the other, okay, so if you look at this, you think, 
does this thing make some sense, right? And I'm starting to argue that it makes some sense. It's not like a mathematical artifact by trying to relate it with the cavity method. Because you see here, this is, this is very similar to the equations that you get from the cavity method. So these cell consistency equations for this, uh, for this omegas of delta come from defining in the cavity method for a given graph this, uh, this uh, density and doing the average over various graphs. And when you do the average, you obtain this. This one here? Yeah. No, this is very difficult to see. Yeah. While this marginal is the marginal that appears in the cavity method. This would be the marginal you would take for the cavity marginals in the cavity method. Okay. Yeah. More questions? Go ahead. Very good, because delta is a complex number, and this is the density of delta, so that means it's a density of the real and the ima ima imaginary part. But then don't, don't we apply the limit of uh, uh, the imaginary part going to zero on, on that set there? Uh, you make it very small. Yeah, yeah, you can do it. And actually, what you can do, very good. Well, so you the, the limit would commute with the integral, right? Yeah, yeah, well, you assume it commutes, and then you see where it works, as usual, all right? But what you can do is you take the real and the imaginary part of this, right? And in principle, you, it's better to, 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 take a, 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 to leave a very small value of delta, of delta, sorry, of, uh, of eta, right? More questions? So, so it, will, it will not be zero, that's what the... For practical reasons, when you, uh, when you solve these equations, yeah, you keep a very small value of, of delta. More questions? Maybe one about the, the exam. <laughs> what? Like I'm going to ask this thing in the exam. No. <laughs> what? Tell me. So about the exam, uh, OK. Uh, I need to think about it. I think it would be three questions to derive things we have discussed, and maybe something that maybe we have not discussed. I need to think about it. Yeah? Okay. But it would be three questions, one question. Uh, the total number of points, I didn't get any, any instruction, but the total number of points is, is going to be 100. I think that the first, the first question has uh, it values 30 points, the second question 25 points, the, f the, the second question 25, and the third question 40, 45, something like this, right? And in each question, you have to, I, I, I ask you things. Eh? I ask you things. So the first question is, uh, no, first question, I ask you several things, and then second question as well, and the third question as well. What else do you want me to tell you about the exam? <laughs> yeah. It will be printed in, 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 in paper. That's another thing I can tell you as well. Yes. What? Yeah? What? Ah, yes. You can use whatever you want. Yes. You cannot ask me, but you can do, do whatever you want. You, you can use the notes. You can look for my articles. You can work in groups. <laughs> you can, can you work in groups? Can they work in groups, Mateo, for the exam? <laughs> yeah, you can work in groups if you want. Yeah. Is that OK? Go ahead. Eh? Hey, I don't listen to the guy. No, in the paper or in your tablet, you can use internet, whatever, right? So the question, OK, the question is the following. So the exam is one hour and a half. Right? If you didn't understand the derivations I did, which again, they are, they are annoying, but they are, they are based on very simple uh, tricks, right? So you are going to spend like a lot of time looking at the nodes, looking at the internet, and you will not have time to do the, the exam. Okay? So yeah, look at whatever you want. If you are not prepared, you, you will fail. <laughs> yeah. More questions about the exam? <laughs> No, listen, the exam is one, hour, is one hour and a half. So think about this. Think of, for instance, think about the, 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 the exercise we did yesterday. It was the whole day. No, no, it was, when was it? Uh, Tuesday, when I asked you to do a derivation. Mm -hmm. It was one hour, one, one hour and a half, no? What happened? Did you manage to do this derivation in one hour and a half? <laughs> 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 
<laughs> more questions? So yeah, OK, so you can work in groups if you want. You can take notes. You can look at my articles. The, I think the, 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 the only thing you're going to do is to ask me, right? Good? Let's go.